Do you love audiobooks? You can get a free 30-day trial membership to audible.com by visiting audibletrial.com slash divebarrockstar. They have thousands of audiobook titles, as well as podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, A-list comedy, and exclusive Audible originals you won't find anywhere else. Get your free trial membership at audibletrial.com slash divebarrockstar. Welcome to the Dive Bar Rockstar Podcast, a show exploring the lives of professional musicians of all types, touring musicians, recording artists, songwriters, engineers, bar bands, wedding bands, and anyone making their living in the music industry. Whether you've dreamed of being a professional or you already are one, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Eric Baines, and I hope that you not only find some entertainment here, but also some helpful tips, trade secrets, and ideas that will help you achieve your dreams. So it's cricket season here in Los Angeles, apparently, and one has gotten into my studio and um, is driving me a bit nuts. But um, it, as you probably know, that's how Buddy Holly and the Crickets got their name, was there was a cricket in the wall of the recording studio that they were they were recording at. So um, in, in keeping with rock and roll tradition, I'm not going to bother trying to eliminate it. I could take a an hour and try to locate it and catch a cricket, um, which is not easy if you've ever tried to catch a cricket. So um, please enjoy it. You know, it's, I'm not going to charge you for it. It's, it's, a little, it's just a little extra bonus for this uh, episode. My guest today on the show is a really cool guy, really great player. He's a multi-instrumentalist, producer, singer, songwriter. He's currently the keyboard player for the band Foreigner. But he's also toured with Enrique Iglesias, Shelby Lynn, Boz Skaggs, Linda Perry, uh, Anastasia, and Dancing with the Stars, just to name a few. He co-hosts a podcast slash YouTube show with the guitar player from Foreigner, Bruce Watson, called Very Important Beer, and it's a total blast. <laughs> they drink beer and they talk to their musician friends, and it's totally my kind of show. So uh, I uh, would highly recommend you check that out. And the video for his latest single with his band Tina Blue debuts on YouTube today, August 18th, and it's a really cool cover of the Rolling Stones classic Paint It Black, so check that out as well. I'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes. I should note that this was recorded on the day that the audio single came out, so don't be confused by the conversation. And I would also like to mention that this episode features the classic sound of internet noises that we've all grown accustomed to in these COVID times, so I hope that doesn't bother you too much. But please enjoy my conversation with Michael Bluestein. So it's a big day for you because yeah. you have a new single out so tell me tell me all about it it says tina blue on on it is that right is that, so a, is that a person it's, it's a it's a band good question we, <laughs> we 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 anticipate confusion with that um <laughs> yeah it's just one of those things yeah it could easily be a person right tina blue but it's 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 an amalgamation of our names her her name's tina terry and people call me blue michael bluestein so tina blue yeah Very so cool. it's but it's a band it's a duo with us and um you know i pretty much produce everything and uh, she sings and I sing some of the time and uh, sometimes farm out some of the parts to other people. Uh, Bruce Watson from Foreigner Very played, cool. played guitars and other, he's been doing, yeah, he, he actually did some great stuff on this track, man. He did. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. You see, so you said you listened to it. That's great. Oh yeah. The, it sounds amazing. I love the song anyways. Classic, you know, paint it black, Rolling Stones. Stones. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, I just I've kind of been excited about this reinvention of some of those classic tunes lately, you know, um, yeah. and it kind of fits her voice and, and her vibe. And, and I've always loved that down tempo kind of like massive attack zero seven um, stereo lab, you know, you know, bands like that, you know, that what I'm talking yeah. about. It kind of, it kind of got really big in the nineties, right? I guess. And uh, I, I've always loved that vibe, you know, just that kind of slow, sexy, you know, sultry kind of stuff, you know, but with a groove with beats and, you know, just good soundscapes and good low end and all that, you know? Right. Yeah. 
I also love if you're going to do a cover, do, 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 you know, give me an opinion about it. You know what I mean? Like take it, do a different exactly. take on it. I don't, I don't like the covers where you listen to it, like, is that the original? I'm not sure. It doesn't, it's, it's so much like it, but this is a very, it's a departure. You know what I mean? Totally. I, I it was funny. I was just talking to a, a good friend about that very thing. It's like, why bother? I mean, I guess the why bother, the answer to why bother would be sometimes people will actually do that, do the, the, the sound alikes they call them, you know, so, right. so that they can, you know, it's obviously much more expensive to get the Rolling Stones master of whatever satisfaction or, you know, miss you or, you know, right. whatever, or whatever brown sugar or something uh, to, to get, you know, both the publishing and, you know, and the master, right. the, you know, the writers, the, the publishing, the writers, the master recording fee, sync fee for that. So people will do a sound alike and then they only have to pay you know, they don't have to pay as much the, like right. the, film, the film or the show. So, so I can see why people do that as like a business artist will do that as right. a kind of business decision. Like, let's try to like make some money, you know? Right. Exactly. But, but I mean, artist, yeah. as an artist know, and, and you're, yeah. you're putting out a single and like, so this was, it's just, a, it's, it's awesome. I really enjoyed it. And the guitars, oh my gosh, so it's, it's just like a moody, really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's all Bruce Watson, who I'm in a band, you know, who I'm in Foreigner with, and he did kind of a, a Bixby pickup thing, kind of like, you know, the, the, the bending. Oh yeah, definitely. And then he used a, uh, a Mooger Fugger, uh, this little filter filter device, you know, which, which generated this kind of wacky sort of, cool. a, almost like, not really like a theremin, but sort of like a, a pitch modulating sound okay. that slowly, you know, um, passes through the frequency range. You know, he did he did some of that, which was cool, which I didn't even expect. But I knew he's he's such a tasteful guy and such a kind of gets gets such great textures. I was like, let's just see what you would do. Like, what do you hear? I love that when you just turn over a track to somebody and you know, what do you hear on this? Well, you know, just go to town. You know. Yeah, yeah. I'm always like, hire the right guy. And let it exactly. Be- <laughs> exactly so yeah so it just just dropped today and uh of course all the streaming platforms the usual suspects spotify apple music didn't I, it didn't look like it was on pandora yet but anyway but most of them and uh yeah we're just trying to get the word out and we actually have another song that we've just we're just putting the finishing touches on uh which is uh the monkey's daydream believer Oh, cool. I'm sure you remember that one too. Yeah, and total reinvention of that to totally, totally different vibe. Um, I, I probably, it'll probably sound arrogant to say, I think it's way better than the original, but I do. <laughs> I really do feel that way. I mean, it's, thank God they wrote the tune. I mean, they're, they're the ones who came up. They're, they're the reason why I get to do this because it's, a, it's an amazing song. Right. Um, but I'm really psyched about our version of that. And that'll, that'll most likely be the next thing that we drop to. Oh, that's awesome. And you said there's a video coming out. Yeah. So, yeah. So for Painted Black, there's a video coming out on August 18th. August 18th. Perfect. Is there going to be a whole record or you're just going to do this tune by tune? It's a good question. You know, it's something that like I wrestle with and she and I, Tina and I wrestle with. It's like the, in this day and age, it's like, is that still a relevant thing? Well, I mean, it's relevant to me because, you know, for people that are old enough that grew up with records and this full, you know, putting on a, an LP or a tape or a CD, whatever your format and this journey that you take, the arc of a, of a record and how it's paced and, you know, the, the, the thought that goes into the ordering of it. I mean, that whole thing is, that's an amazing thing. It feels kind of like a lost art. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I have mixed feelings of like, I do miss that. And I, I do love, love that format, but, but also there's something kind of liberating about just putting out singles. Yeah. Where it's just like, just put out a song and you put your energy into that and you put everything into that and you put it out in the world. And it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's sort of, it's like a little less overwhelming than doing an album, you know? Yeah. Um, and you can kind of take your time with stuff. I mean, hopefully it doesn't slow you down that, that new paradigm of, do, of doing singles. Um, right. But, but, to, but to answer your question, we haven't totally, uh, we haven't totally decided. I mean, it might be an EP. I mean, we're certainly getting enough material to at least do an EP. Um, a full length thing would be cool. You know, um, we'll see right now. It's just in the single realm though. Yeah, I th- I, it gives me hope that people are are into vinyl, because yeah. that means people are actually listening to records. Because there's no way, other way to do it if you've got a record. You know what I mean? You, exactly. You gotta listen to a whole side, if you, you know, before you switch right. artists. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you could. Yeah, you could go over there and like pick up the needle and very carefully go to track three or track four. But yeah, it, right. it, it, encar- it encourages that kind of listening. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, people like whatever talk about side one of Abbey Road by the Beatles or side yeah. two of Abbey Road. Just like yeah. identifying it as a side is is pretty cool, you know. Right, totally. Yeah, man. Albums. I don't know. What do you think? Do you like? Do you want to? Are you still with your creative pursuits? I mean, is it kind of like do you? Are you still hold strong with the album? Like you're you're into that? I really want to. I mean, I I don't think in terms of of singles. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I haven't put out a record in a while, but when I think about now that I have the time off, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about it. And it's like, my brain just goes to record, you know, I, I kind of yeah. like to come up with a concept and then, you know, you want to spend 45 minutes in it, but it's hard for me to think in terms of singles just because for one, it's like, just to put it out there is like 10 bucks versus, you know, 30 bucks to put out a whole record or, you know, as far as, well, actually, stuff. you know what? That's actually, changed. that's not that has changed. Um, and believe me, I've learned a lot about that recently with with doing this. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So through you know, I've, Distro Kid is uh, one of those. There's all these distro, uh, digital distributors now. Distro oh, Kid, right. TuneCore, CD pa- CD Baby. Talk about an older name that's been around yeah. for a while. They do. Yeah. I think. I think their main thing is digital distribution these days. I think that that's kind of, you know, with the death of actual CDs, right? they do a lot of, but DistroKid, you can actually, for $20 per year, you can put out unlimited material. Oh, wow. Well, that yeah. changes everything then. Yeah. As many, so that's kind of encouraging in, in that sense. And, you know, so, so we're going to, as I said, do we have another one that's going to drop before long? We have a couple other ones that are sort of ready, ready to go. And, uh, they handle all the rollout to all, all the, the streaming services. Right. Uh, right. Uh, what do they call them? DSP, digital streaming platforms. We know DSP, digital signal processing. Right. And music, but, <laughs> but the DSP, another one, another current one in that world is a digital streaming platform. So they handle the rollout to Spotify, to Apple Music, to... There's this thing called Deezer. I don't know much about it. Our song is on Deezer. I don't know. I haven't talked to anybody who knows anything about Deezer, but apparently that's a new one too. Wow. Napster. Napster is, I guess, still really big. Huh. Yeah. As a streaming platform. Of course, Pandora, right. Google, Pl- Google Play. Yeah. Um, there's YouTube Music, which right. isn't you. Right. So anyway, there are a lot of them. But you know, what I, you know what I miss is like the B-sides. I think when you're putting out a single, for me, it's like the pressure to make everyone a hit song or, or, or like... You know what I mean? Like when you're doing a record, you're like, well, this song is just for this vibe, you know, and it's not necessarily something you would listen to on its own, but in the, in the context of the record, it's an amazing song. I, I, I totally agree with that. I think that that's maybe there, there is a pressure with that. Um, trying to remove myself with that. I mean, and the, uh, and, and the version that we've done of, of Paint It Black is it's not like a big banger of a, you know, it's a more moody kind of thing. So it's right. not going to be a tr- traditional big single song, like whatever California girls, Katy Perry or something like that. Something like it's not <laughs> a bang. It's not a banger by any stretch, you know? Um, right. But uh, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I, I think it's pr- probably if you're going to do the single thing, it's important not to expect to put that kind of pressure on yourself. Like, okay, this is going to be this smash or something, you know? Right. That being said, I think the next one they're putting out, 
the monkeys one I think is is pretty is pretty bang and pretty high energy. So anyway, yeah, that'll be fun. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait. That's gonna be awesome. Yeah. Well, speaking of records, you have your own solo records that I was I do. Um, yeah. You have three on Spotify, right? That's right. It was interesting listening to it all because Reflections is your first one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and vocal record, very cool. Yep. Very Thanks. Bruce Hornsby, very like totally your voice kind of has an Elvis Costello kind of vibe to it. And, and totally Jamie, you're nailing you're nailing it all. Yep. Totally. <laughs> Jamie <laughs> yeah. Pullum, like, like Oh came, yeah. Oh, just, that's flattering. I love him, man. He's killer. Well, especially when you, you know, you go from this kind of pop song into a jazz piano solo. It's so Jamie, yeah. Pullum, you know, very, very yeah. cool. Um, and then you get to Wild World and Ambient Soul instrumental records. Yep. Um, a little bit of smooth jazz, maybe, but definitely contemporary jazz. Yep. Um, kind of a different thing. All great, by the way. Great melodies, Thank you. great Thank tunes, you. great covers that you picked. Uh, you're obviously, a Steely Dan fan. Huge. Huge. <laughs> but uh, so, what made you sort of make that change and, I don't know, kind of give up on the vocals? Uh, I wouldn't say I really ever gave up on him. Um, but I, but I did take a sort of break from that. And, and I, I guess there's always been these parallel pursuits of songwriting and instrumental and jazz piano. I mean, I fell in love with jazz in high school and, um, college and really went down that path pretty hardcore. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they always kind of existed it's just sort of like, you know, we only have so much energy and attention. So when I was in a, a mode of really working on my jazz, I would just be real super focused on the practicing and the transcribing of solos and, right. and all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, switch gears and kind of like get back to the, the writing of songs and kind of maybe a more simpler, like harmonically simpler approach, which it, what will happen with my songs. I don't write, you know, super super harmonically complex pop songs really you know i mean i wouldn't even see you know, i don't use as many chords as steely dan does i mean i don't know how they who, yeah we all we all would love to know how they've done that in such a way that was you know became so successful in a pop right. realm i mean they're pretty much outliers in that yeah. sense i think that's know? true i think so but to answer your question you know i my initial love of music you know i didn't when i was a kid it was always just like 70s light rock and you know um, whatever, you know, I grew up listening to Cat Stevens and Paul Simon and the Bee Gees and, right. um, you know, came to Steely Dan a little later, you know, uh, all that kind of classic stuff. Um, Joni Mitchell. And yeah. So, I mean, I never, I never have lost my love for that stuff. And, and, and when I take a break and if, when I've took, taken a break and really working on my instrumental playing or my jazz playing, it always, creeps back up on me and reclaims me to write songs and get back and to sing again. I can't, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it just, yeah, definitely. Um, I read this book about creativity once and that I, I'm it's, it's, it's called steal like an artist. I'm forgetting the author's name. And, and he just said like, he's like, you know, he, he basically says, don't be afraid to pursue your different interests within, you know, within your art, even if they seem like totally different, like your question, like, wow, that's where you like, you do this jazz stuff, but then you do these songs of, kind of in a different place, but he just said, you know, the thing that unifies them, the thing that puts them all together is the fact that you did them, whether or not they're really different. And, right. and he talks about for him when he would give up doing one of them, like, you know, he, he was just doing music, but he wasn't writing short stories anymore, or poetry or whatever. He, he would get what he would call phantom limb syndrome. So whatever he had stopped doing, it was kind of like it wanted to go again. It wanted to, to express it, so that I, that's that nails it for me. It's like if I don't if I don't write songs after a while, so it just some one will creep up on me and and just and demand to be written, and like so I'll suddenly be in the middle of writing a skit. You know, just it just kind of happens. And and similarly with the jazz thing, it's become a big part of me in instrumental music. If I don't play it, oh, I really start missing it, and then I'll get back on a gig, and it's like, oh God, thank God, I'm playing this again. I'm supposed to be doing this, you know. So so that I just feel like they're both you know, equally valid and, you know, they just feel like me and I just want to, want to do them, do them both, you know? Yeah. I'm a little in the same boat. I actually, I put out a record years ago that was both like a little bit of instrumental 
and a little bit of you know vocal stuff but but then i went sort of heavy into the smooth jazz and jazz contemporary jazz for like 16 years of my career and yeah. had to, woke up one day and i'm like I remember when i used to sing like why am i not singing right. anymore, you know yeah <laughs> well i mean i think it's easy it's easy to happen man it's like you know part of it could just be you know just survival and economic too yeah, i mean we, you know sure. a lot of time when i started reconnecting to my jazz piano playing and instrumental stuff and like groove music and jam band stuff i was in san francisco and there was a lot of work for good keyboard players you know right. it was like it was sort of like oh you can do that well we want to hire you and like we need i you know jazz singers that needed accompanists you know mm -hmm. jam bands you know that needed keyboard players you know whatever Rhodes b3 funky uh keys you know that kind of stuff right uh, synth, whatever and it was sort of like oh okay well i'm working you know and then and then when you're working and you're getting hired for you you want to be as good as you can be doing it and so for me i was like well that made me want to practice more again so it's sort of like it was the cyclical thing of like okay now i'm deep into that and i'm just going to really concentrate on that for a while, you know, and, and because I'm getting hired to do it and I want to do a great job, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think I have similar sort of experience. We all sort of start out, I'm going to be, I want to be Elton John or I want to be right. really Joel, yeah. but then you're like, but I want to work and I don't want to, yeah. nothing else. Yeah. I can do. So as soon as like making a living starts to guide you, then you, you end up in some crazy places that you never thought that you'd be. <laughs> That's so true, man. I mean, I can't tell you how many stories that, you know, well, why did you get into the, that stuff, music, the kind of thing, you know, kind of music? Well, sure, often, like the answer you want to hear is like, well, you know, that was that was the passion that was driving me. That was the muse. I had no choice. Right. You know, that's all. Uh, that's what I had to do. But sometimes it's just like paying your rent, you know? Yeah. I don't know, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, after all, it's what we do for a living. So we kind of have to we have to be employable and being versatile helps a lot, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I've been pretty, pretty, you know, lucky, but at the same time, there's been moments when I'm like, well, I don't really have the luxury of deciding what music I play every night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause it's, yeah. it's my living. So yes. I'm going to go do this gig. I'm not going to love it, but you know, at least I'm not flipping burgers, which is kind of my only other skill. <laughs> Dude, you got more skills than me for me it's just music i don't i can't even do the burger flipping thing <laughs> well i worked at wendy's in high school that's as much that's oh, okay, as cool. like. <laughs> apprenticed at wendy's yeah exactly yeah And now you're uh, playing with the world famous band Foreigner. And uh, so that's quite a, quite a leap from jazz to one of the biggest rock bands yeah. ever in yeah. the history. Um, yeah. how, did, how did that all happen? Did you have to audition for that gig? Or? I did. Yeah, in uh, 2008, I ran into Paul Murkovich at NAMM. And people who don't know Paul Murkovich, great keyboard player, musical director guy, has been the musical director on The Voice. Okay. Mm -hmm. God, I can't even remember how many years, well, 10, 10 years, maybe however long the voice has been happening. Anyway, um, he had come on as an interim member of foreigner around that time in 2007 and, uh, into early 2008. And when he came on, he said, you know, I'll help you guys out, play some keys with you, but for you, but I can't, you know, I have other commitments. I can't make this a permanent thing, but I'll help you find someone when I have to leave. So it was just, just, you know, good timing ran into him at NAM in 2008 and we hadn't seen each other. We had worked together 
with another artist, Anastasia, back in 2004 and 2005. He had, oh, been the yeah. musical, he had been the musical director for Anastasia. I had auditioned and gotten the gig on that and toured with her for a couple of years. Oh, cool. And, and so, you know, knew Paul and he knew kind of, you know, what I could do and kind of keyboard player I was and everything. And uh, yeah, so I ran into him and he said, you know, great, let's bring you in for an audition because I can't do this gig for that much longer. And that's how it worked out, you know. Oh, that's great. Um, and, you know, speak, and with the foreigner thing, again, you know, it's like I grew up in the, I was a kid in the 70s. So, you know, foreigner in the late 70s. Yeah. You know, the word ubiquitous comes to mind. I mean, it was just, <laughs> I mean, just constant. And I yeah. love those tunes. Again, I yeah. loved 70s rock and 70s pop. And I was like, yeah, I, <laughs> so for me to, it, it, you know, it, it never, these different things, they don't feel like a stretch because I, I love them all, you know? So, yeah. You know. Yeah. And it seems like you get to kind of play on that gig. I was watching, there's a YouTube clip of you doing the intro to a uh, jukebox hero. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, at least you, you kind of get a moment to, to do some stuff. That was kind of cool. Yeah. I do like uh, some synth stuff and then some, you know, the, there's some loops go down and it becomes a kind of keyboard and drum solo joint. Yeah thing we collaboration kind of thing it's for it's like a keyboard feature for a while then it morphs into the drum feature and then we start the tune and start that that you know signature classic intro right. to jukebox hero that everyone knows yeah you're gonna put that up in post right no, yeah, I'm just yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, i've been doing that but honestly though the sound was so bad so i'll look uh, for it i know because i honestly thought about that and i'm like oh the sound is really bad and i don't know if you're listening on headphones if it would come across that good but it's a, yeah so when you so then you got the gig and did you have a lot of time to prepare or that were you just kind of thrust out there did you get to rehearse uh so there were three songs um that they wanted me to prepare i was waiting for a girl like you jukebox hero and it feels like the first time got you so i i didn't the thing is, it's such a synth-heavy gig, and there were so many sounds to cover. Right. Paul was very prepared and very meticulous, and gave me all the sh the sheet music actually that he had he had played it into Logic and just printed out printed out the parts. Um, so I was going along with that and going along with live recordings. So I, I knew all the parts when I came in, you know, and was very familiar with what I was playing. But it, the big thing that was was the kind of a curveball, which I knew was going to be a curveball going in, was like you know, there are four keyboards on the rig at the time. Where are all these sounds laid out right. you know, for people that are listening in that maybe aren't keyboard players or aren't musicians? Like, it's like you map out sections of the keyboard. So maybe there's some strings in the lower two octaves of the keyboard. You get it to the middle. Maybe there's a piano there. Maybe there's horns. Maybe there's samples. You know, you have to know where everything's in, and you lay that when you program, you lay all these different sounds out in different zones of the keyboard so that you can, at the right time, you can jump to the chorus. Oh, okay, there's the chorus figure. It's up on this, this top keyboard way up in the top, top octave and you play it up there. So, so that was the thing of like, you know, I just didn't know where, and, and then he, if he tells you where it is in that second, okay, you're going to play and then you're going to jump here. Obviously, you need a little time to, for the chord, it's, it's sort of like, it's like the choreography that keyboard players right. that we keyboard players have to do. You have to jump around and be infinite. You know, it's like, okay, now this is the B section. I jump up here and I do that. So, and it takes a little while to become comfortable with that. If, if you're doing a lot of it, you know, so, so, oh yeah. So there were things I was missing like crazy on the edition because I, I was like, where did he say that part was? There's four keyboard. I can't remember. You know, <laughs> he just, he just told me, you know, so, right. uh, and, and then also they threw some vocals, some background vocals out because I sing on the gig too. And they threw background vocals at me, like right then. So, okay, so so we get to the chorus. This is your note. And so it was like, okay, remembering this is what the, the new note is and then remembering where to jump to. So so I, I wouldn't say that <laughs> yeah. I nailed all that at all because <laughs> it just it didn't, I, I couldn't process all that new information that quickly, you know. Right. But, uh, but I, guess, I guess I nailed it enough. So <laughs> yeah. it's all you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. so then at, once you got the gig then was it like did they rehearse a lot or because it seems like they really. work a lot foreigner does work a lot um under normal circumstances like right easily 100 plus shows a year 100, yeah. 105 to 110 you know easily yeah um so 
so yeah there wasn't and it's not a big band that's big on rehearsing a ton you know yeah, right. so we you know i, I basically came out of uh, when i was going to start in march of 2008 i came out to just sort of be there play with them during sound checks paul was still playing keys with the band he was still on the gig but i kind of came into kind of you know to ease my way in for a couple of days uh right. you know so i would i would practice with them on sound check for a few tunes then i'd go out and hang out and watch him do the gig you know and then we did that for a couple of nights and then i think on the third night or maybe it was two or three shows that i got i saw him do and then he took off and i was on the gig and it was yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it was sink or swim you know yeah, yeah. the training wheels are off exactly <laughs> That's pretty cool. And we're, so you were obviously a fan when you were a kid too. So that, yeah. so it was, it was probably pretty cool to just be now I'm playing with these dudes. The ju- <laughs> yeah. First night doing jukebox hero was definitely, I was fanboying hard up there. You know, I was, yeah. The lights go down and the intro starts and I'm hitting that. Boom, 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 you know, yeah. Thomas Dolby, Thomas Dol- Dolby did all the keys. A lot of people don't know that. Oh, wow. That was, that was before Thomas Dolby was, you know, she blinded me with science and had his own career. He was a keyboard session whiz guy, uh, you know, great programmer and great s- keyboard sound guy, manipulator and programmer. And he was brought in on four and four to program and play, play synths. And so a lot of what I'm playing on those classic, uh, you know, four and four songs like urgent, Jukebox Hero, Waiting for a Girl Like You. Almost all of that is Thomas Dolby's stuff. Wow. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool to have a gig that works that much too because it just seems like, you know, there's so many gigs that are just a summer tour or a pop tour that's out for a year and then it's, and the, the artist goes away, you know, to have one of the... Because I, I work with Dwight Yoakam now and it's kind of the same type of gig where he just works like crazy and it's kind of a lucky thing to have at this yeah day. man i think we're similar in the sense too so you have your records out and then you've got your gig and it's like the juggling side man versus artist were you ever did you ever envision being the artist oh absolutely when you were making these i mean records and stuff i mean you said it you know i mean i think it's a pretty common thing you know i mean and I mean, I'm saying you said Billy Joel, Elton John. I mean, as a piano player, as a keyboard player, those guys were kind of the benchmark of right. you know amazing songwriters and great players, and just reached the pinnacle of success. You know, yeah, brilliant guys, and they kind of yeah. You mentioned Bruce Hornsby earlier. Obviously, he's had a great great career, and yeah, I mean, I for a while when I was in San Francisco in the '90s, I thought that's what it was going to be, or I was going to. Uh, I was going to do that, you know, that I was going to pursue that. And, you know, I was writing a lot and I had bands and yeah, I I think that, you know, the reality of that over time will, you know, the the reality of that choice and the work involved and the commitment of that choice, it it will weed out people. And it definitely, it weeded me out as far as was I ready to put, absolutely everything into that and turn down other things and do the starving artist thing for a while. And, you know, as we know, you know, you get in a van and you you tour endlessly and, you know, there are very few, there are very few overnight success stories, as we all know, it's usually pounding the pavement, you know, and, and hitting it for years before hopefully you get some sort of break or in those days, maybe get a record deal, you know, um, um, you know, whatever that, that, uh, you know, that gold, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know, which I think most people would agree these days in that world is probably harder than ever because, because of streaming and because of the low royalty rates and because of, you know, the lack of actual physical CD sales, CD sales and all that. I mean, so, 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 you know, if it was hard, then it's even harder now, I think, but, um, you know, but, but I also, you know, because of the, of the stuff we said before being, employable as a keyboard player and getting other work and it was sort of like okay well i can make a a living here doing this other stuff which i like doing too yeah so i didn't have that all or nothing kind of drive to be a solo artist the way i think you really you you need to have if you don't have that you're pretty much done i think because it's going to be so hard even if you do have it you have so much work cut out for you so if you don't have that that insatiable hunger to do that 
I, I don't, you know, it, that's kind of the writing on the wall, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do. I totally yeah. agree. I think yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm much the same boat. And now it's like, now when you put out a record, it's more about expressing yourself and, and, and not so much pressure and like, this is going to be my living or this is going to yeah. be, you know, this is going to be the record that breaks me. You know, now it's like, Oh, I just need to make a record. And, and it's, I know and and it's, it's your soul, ex- you know, expression yeah and and i i love songwriting and i love producing i love being in the studio i could spend all my time here you yeah. know i love the toys and crafting a song and and the sonics of it and mixing and all that it's like it's it's i i, I it's probably in music nothing i love more than that journey you know i mean you know sure i love being on stage i love performing and you know i'm a performer too and but there's just something so special and unique about being able to craft something and find your vision in the studio, you know, and, and yeah. just come up with that perfect keyboard part or that perfect guitar part or that, you know, that perfect, you know, or, or finding the perfect, per- like you said, hire the right person, get the perfect yeah. person that you know is going to get the vibe of the song and bring them into the studio or these days send them the track and have them put, put it down in their own, <laughs> in their own right. studio. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, all those things we said about the, I mean, I still am super passionate about that. And, you know, that's, what's been like the silver lining about this whole COVID thing is that, you know, sure. Our, our, you know, our work has dried up touring, but it's given me this incredible gift of all this time to pursue that stuff and come up with these. And that's why I'm, you know, dropping singles now and, recording and writing with I, people because it's like i've just got all this extra time and yeah you know it gives you that space to kind of to explore what, yeah what, 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 you, what, what your vision is you know and to just get lost in a song and like lose yeah. track of time like when you were a kid and didn't have anything to do and you just got lost in it you know i, I that's what i've been noticing too it's just like oh, yeah. it's, it's a long time since i've been able to just like well I don't have anything to do till like January. So um, I could really put all my energy into this one song, you know? I, I, for me, I, I need that kind of attention. I think most people would say that. It's like, for me, if there's a song that I'm working on or a mix I'm trying to get right or a production I'm trying to get right, it's just like, it takes all my energy for days, you know, yeah. just to really, you know, you know, a three minute song. It's like, we know what that's, <laughs> if, you're, if you're paying attention to every detail and every note that everything's playing, you know, it's like, you, you, it, there's a lot that goes into that, you know? Yeah, for sure. And yeah. another thing we have in common is we both went to Berkeley College of Music. Oh, yes. <laughs> in fact, I was looking at your dates and I think we were there together for like the last semester. Where you, did you, you graduated 91? Yeah, I think I officially, I, I got there at 87 and I don't think I officially graduated until 92. But yeah, it was oh, 87, gotcha. 87 and 91 was, were basically the, the years, yep. It was my first semester was a, the winter of 91. So we were there together. We cried. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Did you go for the whole time or just no, some of I, no, I actually, it all ended up being three semesters over about two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went and then I took a year. I had, I couldn't afford to go back basically. So I went home and worked there for a year, came back for a year. Um, so it was kind of on and off for me, but uh, it started in 91 though. Yeah. So well, three semesters there is a lot. You get a lot of information. Yeah. A lot of any theory that you want to get into. Um, you know, I, were you doing like more bass performance or? Well, I, I tested in pretty high too. So I was able to get through all, I tested into like harmony two and ear training three, which is cool, but I'd never done solfege before. So getting into ear training three with never having really experienced that was a little tricky but um so i got a lot crammed in there but i was a songwriting major i was an arranging major ah, okay and a songwriting major uh, so you know three semesters and two two majors so I, I don't know i was just there to get whatever i could get you know what yeah. I mean? just soak it up as much information as i possibly could yeah no it's pretty intense i mean I mean, I was staying there four years. So looking back, it's like, wow. But, you know, but I, I was at that point pretty far down the jazz rabbit hole for at least the first two to three years. Were you a jazzer or a rocker? Way more of a jazzer, way more. Yeah, yeah so was I for sure. But, yeah. uh, but it's, and it's ironic that you end up in Foreigner. Yeah. I guess <laughs> just uh, again, um, <laughs> it brings us back to the original thing. Yeah, it's sort of, it never, you know, um, I never lost sight of 
the roots, I guess, yeah. you know. And were you a performance major? Yeah, I started as a performance major and then I switched to what they, yeah, they call professional music. Oh, yeah. Which, was, which would basically allow you to kind of mix and match your courses a little bit. So I think I threw in a little bit of songwriting and lyric writing courses in there too. Um, a little bit of synthesis. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I don't think I did any real film scoring classes, but um, a little bit of arranging and um, yeah. So, so it was basically allowed you to do a kind of wider spectrum of stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. And you're originally from Brookline? Yep. Brookline, Mass. Yeah. So it wasn't too far. You just hopped no. on the subway. No, I went to high school in Brookline. I, yeah, I actually originally from Haverhill, Massachusetts, which is about 30 miles north of there. Uh, but, but yeah, I, yeah, my mom was still there in Brookline when I was going to school, but I just wanted to be more on campus and more yeah. around the stuff 24 seven. So I ended up getting an apartment uh, really close by. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the great part about Berkeley too. You can, it's just 24 seven music if you want to. You know, that was the, my favorite part about it. Was just being oh, around totally. great musicians. I mean, at that age, they were the greatest musicians I'd ever heard. And oh my god, just being able to play all the time, just play, play, play. It was just the best, you know. It was humble. It was humbling too, you know. Looking back, I mean, it's just because you you've got guys that are the best from all their different cities and towns and whatever yeah. America, wherever America and all over the world, not just America. There were Japanese and German and Austrian and. Italian and Spanish, Eastern Europeans, you know, it was a real melting pot of people. And, you know, I mean, I just remember getting in classes with guys, you know, that could just hear so advanced, like, you know, I did this, yeah, I won't geek out too hard, but some this atonal soul fetish stuff where you're singing, you're singing intervals that are, you basically get out of a central, uh, out of a, out of a key center and you have to be able to sing the craziest intervals, you know, and and hear them. And I just remember getting in that class and there were people that could already do it and, you know, pretty well. And it was just, it was, it was humbling. It was great because it was, it was, it was an ass kicker and it really makes you step up your game game and find out where your weaknesses are and and address them. Yeah. Big time. I also was like from a small town and I was kind of the big fish get there. And so I didn't really practice. I was just always busy playing. So when I got there and I meet people that were like, well, I've done six hours of practicing and I still got another three hours on my ear training and four hours on my lesson. And I'm just like, wow, I've got to, I've got to step it up on so many levels. And then you also have like, Abe Laboriel Jr. was there when I was there. Yeah. You know, Matt Garrison, like guys who's, who's yes. parents, whose parents, you know, they grew up here in this great jazz stuff. And, you know, I had, my dad was into the Beatles and stuff, but from the jazz thing, it was all, you know, I, I, I just felt so like, wow, if, if I had from birth been hearing this music, you know, they have such an advantage. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Oh man, the musical family thing. I'm very similar to you. Like, like I told you what my parents were, well, you know, Stevie wonder, my mom exposed me to a lot of Stevie wonder. That was cool. But yeah. you know, neither, neither of my parents were musicians and, you know, I, I started piano when I was nine, which was, you know, sort of not, I wouldn't say old, but, but not super young either, but you know, young enough, I guess. But yeah, what you said exactly that was humbling and that was really um, a reality check when you get, you get with these guys that have been, it, it's like breathing for them and they've grown up in these families and, and uh, are already so ahead of the game. So as we know, it's a tough business, man, and you got to have your stuff together and you got to, you know, it's it just, it, yeah. it, it was a real wake up call of like, wow, I've got so much to learn and I have some catching up to do and, you know, a lot of practicing to do. And I'm glad I did. You know, I'm glad I yeah. had that experience. Uh, well, it turned out great. I mean, I've only, I've only technically played, I think one gig with you. We, we did some weird like steakhouse. I totally remember that in Hollywood. I totally remember. Yeah. We were upstairs in this like weird loft space. Yeah. Yeah. We were playing jazz and it was just such a strange, were yeah. there, there were there, I think there was some seating up there. Seating. Yeah. I think, well, there was seats was there? in front of us, but then I don't remember. I actually ended up in that same place. It turned into a nightclub. I, I ended, uh, okay. ended up going to a party there a few years ago, but uh, I don't know. It was weird. But I, I also remember, I, and I don't even remember the sax guy's name, and I don't, I don't think I'd say it either. But, but it was like weird because what, I remember one time we're playing this tune, and it just sounds awful. But uh, you know, we're kind of killing it. The rhythm section's doing it, and he turned around at the end. And he goes, 
well, that was something. And I looked at his chart and I'm like, what was wrong? And I looked at his chart and his chart wasn't transposed. So he was like, we were all playing in the same key, but he's played a saxophone. You know what I mean? So he's just not playing the right melody the entire time. And he was playing it. Oh my God. And I was like, oh. Yeah, I remember there was some, shall I say, um, because we were just sight reading all this, this stuff, you know, which is kind of fun, but. We're maybe playing some standard, I think some yeah. standards and stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't remember it being the most musically satisfying gig I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, but, but anyway. yeah, I remember we bonded on that and we kind of had fun and had some laughs and uh, was, there was a drummer on that gig too, right? Yeah. I was trying to remember today who it, be. it might've been Chad, right? Cause I know I, I thought I got the, gig i don't i don't remember I don't oh remember. man i don't even love it or how the gig came up but that would have been like two, seriously 2003 oh, or four probably because i moved to la in 2003 and it was pretty shortly after i moved to la i'm pretty yeah. sure yeah yeah probably 2004 i remember you saying that you had just moved to town yeah okay 2004 yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah. wow I, I i thought i thought I remembered that we did one gig together. So yeah. I'm glad. You but I always remembered that. you because you're just a great, awesome player. It was very well, Thanks, man. Thank you. <laughs> so there are a lot of us out of work right now, uh, waiting to get back to playing shows and touring. And I know I've had to do whatever I can do to take my mind off the situation from time to time. And one of the ways to pass the time is to catch up on some books you've missed. But if you're like me and you don't love to read, <laughs> there's another way you can consume. Audible.com has thousands of titles to choose from, including audiobooks about music production, songwriting, the music business, music theory, instructional audiobooks, and biographies of your favorite musical heroes. But besides audiobooks, you can also listen to podcasts, theatrical performances, A-list comedy, and exclusive audio originals you won't find anywhere else. Right now, you can get a free 30-day trial if you visit audibletrial.com slash divebarrockstar. That's audibletrial.com slash divebarrockstar, and you can catch up on your audio reading. I'd like to take a second to thank you for listening to the Dive Bar Rockstar podcast. As a new podcast, getting the word out is a vital part of what it takes to keep the show on the road. Uh or off the road, as the current case may be. If you would like to support the podcast, all you got to do is subscribe wherever you listen. And if you have an extra minute or two, please leave a review. You can also share and follow the podcast on your social media apps. Okay, enough begging. I hope you're having fun. And once again, thank you for listening. And so has Berkeley, like that experience, uh, has that... It's how has that affected your career? Are you glad that you went to college? Do you bring that to the job every day, or is that? Uh... I, I really am glad. Like I'm, I, you know, I. I think that you know people talk about uh, sort of. There's a there's this kind of outlier extreme thing of these people that never you know, quote unquote, never learned a note of theory or, or never learned a, a bit of theory or never learned how to read anything, you know, like I was talking about like the Beatles, you know, Paul McCartney and right. John Lennon, those guys didn't read music and look what they came up with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that may be true, but you know, we're not all Paul McCartney and John Lennon, you know, um, I know I'm certainly not. And, you know, I, mean, I, I think that if you have a feel for music and you have some soul in you, that you, when you learn this other stuff, for me, in my experience, for me, it only helped, you know, I feel like I had, I had a feel and I had musicality, um, but I, it needed some attention and it needed, I needed more knowledge. And especially as a piano player, I mean, you know, there's, there's so much, you know, you, you get the ADA keys and harmony. Yeah. And I just know, I feel like knowledge is power as, as a keyboard player, you know, or any musician really. And I, I've, I've never felt really that, that uh, the knowledge that, that I acquired there and, and, expanding my palate in that way has gotten in the way. I felt like it, it only just helps. And, it, and, and it's certainly in the, the jazz and the reading world, it's, it's made me more employable. Um, I've, you know, I've done a lot of teaching in the past. I haven't been teaching much lately, but it's, it's given me the tools to, right. to teach and pass on that knowledge in an articulate way, which I love to be able to do. 
right? right. You can kind of continue that journey for people and pass it on. I, I love that part of it. You know, um, it just, yeah, I, it sort of unlocks a lot of the mystery of music and, you know, it, it's not all unlocked. It, it never will be, you know, I mean, I feel like it's always, you know, whenever you start a new song or start a new solo or whatever it is, you know, you can't, it, it, you, you can't just plug in a formula no matter how much you know that's not that's not music so you know you'll always be kind of on in the dark in certain ways right whenever you work on a new tune or, or, or a new production or anything it's just you're always building it from the ground up but to have that background of the knowledge and the information behind me for me has been really empowering it's been really um it's it's it made me better and um yeah i i, I so so that's a long-winded answer <laughs> Well, I love it because I, I think that too, but there's also it nowadays too, there's also the whole, well, you're going to come out of school about a hundred grand in debt. And then how are you going to, you know, so there's, I don't know, there's almost this thing of discouraging people to, to go to great schools, you know, and I'm always really like, uh, that's true. I get it. But there's scholarships. It just means you're going to have to work a little harder, but I just think the education is always worth it, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. And certainly st- stuff is more expensive than ever. The schools, I know Berkeley's not cheap. Um, I did take right. loans out. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, luckily, nothing close to a hundred grand. Of course, we're talking about the late eighties when I went there. So, right. you know, the budget, yeah. you know, the, the, the tuition was considerably less, but, you know, probably even adjusted for inflation, I would think. But, um, yeah, <laughs> the music biz now too, right? Yeah. Here we are in 2020. Compared to, we taught like you got in there in 91, similar to me, late, you know, I was late 80s. And I mean, look how much has changed. You know, here we are, here we are, everybody's, we have people are making albums on their laptops, you know. Yeah. Um, everyone's a producer. Everyone's a producer. <laughs> the, the, the conventional studio model, sure, it still exists, but it's, it's way diminished. Um, you know, those kind of jobs, a lot of those jobs have vanished, right? Yeah. Um, making money in album sales has gone almost completely away. Not completely, right. but... <laughs> Pretty close. Close enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would think that, you know, so when I, you start thinking about, like you said, laying down a hundred grand to go somewhere... Like, where does that come back? Where does that come back? Uh, I mean, thank God. Like, let's keep our fingers crossed, man. Knock on wood. Like, live entertainment is keeping us going. And we're still doing that. And we're still kicking. We're hitting hitting the road. We can still make a living doing that, you know. Yeah. Which is why this time is particularly devastating. Because now we can't even do that right this particular moment. Exactly. uh, Exactly. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a really good point. And I thought about that when I, when I, my mom still lives right around the corner mm-hmm. from Berkeley on Boylston street. She's got a, she's got a oh, wow. there. Oh, crazy. That's yeah. Crazy. And you know, I come back there and they've expanded, they're building a new building and the enrollment is up and I'm like, wow, what is that? You know, I, I'm, I'm psyched for people that I love music and kids that are passionate and want to go and that have parents that, are, are, are behind them and they're going and they're learning because man the thing is even as the economics of it change that passion doesn't change right i mean yeah. you're still gonna you still have kids coming up that get so excited about songs and singing and playing and making records and producing and like thank god that i mean yeah. no matter what's happening with the economics of it it's it doesn't make that other stuff go away that stuff's just as real as it's ever been yeah and and, you know just as humans we have to pursue our passions and like sometimes it's like economics be damned you know i mean it's like yeah uh, so i mean but you know it's not all and and from what i've heard it's obviously not you know all doom and gloom i mean there's Mm -hmm. place you know there's still need for music and film and tv there's ad campaigns there's there's, there's teaching, there's live performance, like we were saying, there's, uh, I guess a lot of kids are making beats, sell their beats online. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You know? yeah. Uh, and that's the, that's the odd part about it really. And not to sound like an old bitter guy, but, um, it, it, it's the need and the want and the love and the use for music has not diminished yet. 
people's willingness to pay for that <laughs> has, has, you know, it's like, it'd be one thing if, if you owned a photo mat and now no one uses film anymore, you know, people need music more than ever and, and love it and want it. Yet there's just their desire to actually pay for it. Has, like, Oh, we don't have to, well, we're not gonna, you know, and whatever it is what it is. It's not, you know, it's nothing complaining about it. Not going to change it, but uh it, it is no, a big thing. It's something to think about when you're, you know, as a listener, I guess, it, when you're purchasing music is that somebody put a lot of time and energy and probably skills and, and education and all that. So I know man. Into the same music, it's, a, it's cheaper to make, but it's still not cheap to make per se. Like to, well, you can't quantify. It's hard to, it's hard to quantify the amount of hours and dedication that it took to get to that point from a, to be able to do that masterfully from a playing, from a writing, from a right. playing, from a singing, from a producing point of view, all those things. How do you quantify that exactly? But yeah, most people, if they're paying at all, right, they're paying $10 a month for Spotify or $10 a month for Apple music or what's Pandora 50 bucks a year or something now. I don't even know. I don't know. I didn't, I, I, I've never paid for that one. <laughs> yeah, I have it. I think I did at one point, but yeah, I have actually, I have a Spotify and an yeah. Apple music account now. Um, and it's 10 bucks a month, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, it is really sad. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we should, we don't want to go down that. We don't want to be, like yeah. you said, we don't, we don't yeah. want to get too depressive about it or too doom and gloom about it, but because it, it is what it is where we are right now. Uh, I've heard about title. I've been hearing about title. Yeah. I've heard about that again recently. Yeah. High, higher, resolution streaming mm -hmm. for a similar amount of money and, and they pay better artist royalties from what I've, what I've been reading, which uh -huh. is cool. So, um, uh -huh. yeah, it's difficult. Like how much do you go against the tide? I mean, like that's the reality of what it is right now. Yeah, so for when sure. we put, when we put out new music, right. If, if we're going to say, no, I'm not going to put it on yeah. Spotify or no, I'm not going to put it on Apple. Well, then how are people going to hear it? You know, that's what they're, that's what they're listening to now. So, yeah, you know, yeah. it's true. I, but you know, but you bring up, a, it's good. It is sad when you get people that, that have no concept of why they would ever pay for music. Right. Right. It's like, it's kind of like, well, why would it, you know, just kind of want to say, well, here's why, you know, like you yeah. said, it costs money to do it. It costs money to have the skills. And, mm. um, so at the least people like, Pay the ten bucks a month. Yeah, right. Don't don't do the Spotify free thing with the ads. Like yeah. at least pay the at least pay the ten bucks. It's like ten dollars a month for every song in the world. You know, like it's no. worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> like ten dollars. That's like one record a month in nineteen eighty six. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, a lower price ones because weren't they like for so a lot of them were like sixteen ninety nine. But yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. I remember going over the Tower Records, remember across the street yeah. was, was it was still open, yeah. right? When you when yeah. you got there. Yeah. That place was amazing. I used to yeah. live there. Man, I would be buying CDs all the time. And yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you would be like, Oh, it's only eight ninety nine. It's a bargain. It's nine, yeah. ten bucks. Totally. That's amazing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> was, what a steal. It's on sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you were buying you know you're buying records and you know you're trying to learn and you're trying to soak up all that inform the information and music and so you you know if you could buy you know 20 records a week you'd do it you know <laughs> like it was, it was yeah. a, an investment just to be able to have access to all that music i used to be over at looney tunes i'll remember looney tunes oh yeah, looney tunes, yeah. Wilson, yeah. yeah i would get all my vinyl there that place was great yeah. for the vinyl yeah but what was the there was a record store on um uh, what's the other oh man now I can't remember the tower records is on that street back bay Newberry comics yes <laughs> Newberry was, comics was yeah. on Newberry tower was on the corner of Newberry and Mass yeah. Ave and yeah, Mass right, exactly. yeah 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 the yeah. so Newberry comics that was another good place for for records that was a great place great <laughs> place yeah uh, Boston I miss Boston I love going back there yeah you <laughs> see so you do sometimes but yeah once in a while on the road on tour yeah, on tour, yeah. yeah. so I'll have like an afternoon there and uh, once in a while, I used to, I, I was playing with Keiko Matsui for 12 years for, for a long time. So we'd play at Scullers, uh, years ago. So then we would be there for like four or five days in a row. Cause it was the club gig, you know? So yeah. then I would love it. We would just take the subway in and, and, uh, I'd go see recitals at Berkeley, see what the kids are doing. Yeah, man. <laughs> Berkeley Performance Center. Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty yeah. fun. 
But I think all of that, like we've kind of already talked about, but uh, beyond just Foreigner and your jazz records, you've had a super eclectic career as far as like you've played with Shelby Lynn, uh, Enrique Iglesias, um, Anastasia, like you said, Foreigner and Boss Skaggs. Boss Skaggs. Like that a was, lot of... Yeah, that was incredible. That was really amazing. Yeah. Just all those songs and his his legacy, his his hits, you know, it was it was called the hits tour. So, you know, it was a lot oh, of stuff cool. from Silk, a lot of stuff from Silk Degrees from 77, like, you know, Lido Shuffle and the Funky Lowdown and all those kind of classic. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I met Boz because actually at the time Boz was doing some standards. He he had a kind of parallel thing that he was doing. And and I that's how I met him was I subbed playing piano with him at a, at a jazz festival up in, uh, was it, I think it was Aspen. Yeah. The Aspen jazz festival in Colorado. And Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Snowmass. So I, yeah. That's where I'm from. So. I know oh, that. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. So I did that with him. And at the time it was just good timing again, because he was putting together his band for the hit store that coming summer. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think it was spring actually. And we did. Um, and so, he was like, yeah, well, I need somebody who plays B3 Hammond organ. And I said, yeah, I do that too. So, um, and, uh, that's, that's how I met him. How was he to work with? He was great, man. It was such a sweet guy. Um, kind of understated in a lot of ways, not a, not a, you know, just sort of calm kind of demeanor, kind of sort of like stoic kind of, uh, demeanor, I would say in certain ways, but very kind and, you know, generous dude. And, uh, yeah, the shows were great. And, you know, he has this following. I mean, you know, at that time, we were playing a lot of the same places that I play with Foreigner now, you know, sort of that, that classic rock circuit, you know. Right, right. Yeah. That's cool. We did, we did Humphreys down in San Diego. I think that was the closest oh, yeah. one. Humphreys by the Bay um, down in San Diego. And that's probably the closest L.A. thing we did. And you were with Enrique Iglesias for a while. A couple of years. Yeah, about, about a year and a half or two. Yeah. And how was a gig like that? Big pop gig. How does that feel different than being on a foreigner gig, for instance, you know? Well, there's definitely, just from a performance standpoint, there are more tracks involved because, you know, the records are sort of more, it, it, it's, I mean, I would say Enrique is probably a, a legacy artist at this point too, because he came out in the nineties, right? And uh, right. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, although he's had, he's had a lot of hits even going into the two thousands and, um, you know, so he's seems like he stayed relevant pretty long probably yeah. still is, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it was, it was much more of a pop gig from the standpoint that there were more tracks involved and, um, you know, le obviously less rock, uh, yeah, some rock right. guitar and stuff, but, um, a little more on the pop side in that, you know, foreigner does not use tracks at all. Got you. We do not use any tracks. Cool. So everything's live. So, um, you know, so it's pretty typical for pop acts to use some tracks because with yeah. modern production, you have certain sounds that get, get, are pretty hard to recreate on stage, you know? So you just, you, you do the, you use some of those. Right. As you know. Yeah. So, um, so it was different, maybe more like that, but yeah. And he's kind of international heartthrob. So, so, you know, lots of screaming girls. <laughs> uh, uh, right. Bigger venues, probably. Big venues. Definitely. Yeah. Well, huge venues. Yeah. So I want to talk about uh, your show. Like the rest of us, I started a podcast. We, we I mean, we, what else are we going to do? And uh, you guys started, uh, it's a, is it only on YouTube or is it? Well, yeah, it's, it's actually on YouTube and all the podcast platforms, you know. Oh, and so it goes out as a pod, app, podcast. App, yeah, exactly. So we film it. it we, we, the main focus is the, the YouTube, the, the Zoom video part of it with some post-production stuff too. And, uh, but then it all, the audio portion gets pushed out on Spotify and Apple Music too. Cool. Yeah, we've been doing that. We started it in April. Uh, so we've been doing it for, we're on a slight hiatus right now. We're kind of reconfiguring a couple of things, but we've done, God, we've done 17 or 18 shows, I think at this point. We were doing it, been wow. doing it once a week, just, just to show you how long quarantine, you know, we basically, once quarantine, we were off the road and that started early April. We launched the first show and it had been weekly since then until just this past week. Uh, wow. but yeah so it all kind of came about because bruce and i would do these vibs stands for very important beer yes we would we were doing those on the road so if we had a night off and there was a brewery within striking distance we would 
you know, try to hook something up where we would come and do a little acoustic show, either bring two guitars or a guitar and a keyboard and uh, play some foreigner songs, drink some of their local beer, meet up with the fans, do some pictures, some signings. And it just kind of became like a kind of like a, a meet and greet sort of thing, though, with a little concert and kind of hang and, and you know, with the, the centerpiece being local craft beer, you know. You guys come up with a lot of beers that I've never heard of, which I love because I'm, you know, I like beer. Yeah. So we do obviously the IPAs and, and you know, you're from Colorado. Like the IPAs are huge up there. Yeah. That's uh, my thing for sure. You like IPAs? Yeah. That's my oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Got one right now, actually. Oh, dang. Lateral, right. lateral haze um, by Deep Ellum out of Texas, out of Dallas. Uh, and we actually had them as a sponsor on the last beer show. They, oh, very they, cool. Uh, they sent us, sent us a bunch of beer. Um, but uh, yeah, so it just it started sort of like in quarantine. I mean, we can't do these shows. We can't do these actual events. So let's do it virtually, you know, and yeah. bringing on guests, you know, that's kind well, of how it's it all really interesting. Up. And, and uh, you know, it's it's much like a lot of podcasts now in, in terms of interviewing guests and stuff. But the thing I love about the visual, because I, I just do the audio, but it's like we get to see everybody's home studio. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. And you get into right now. Yeah. I see you're, you got, you got lots of guitars and basses back there. I love it. Yeah. 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 I've, I finally have a pretty, pretty okay. I, I turned my garage into a studio last year. So I was, I'm pretty, pretty comfortable, but it, it seems like, especially in this COVID time, but like kind of in general, I feel like the home studio is, is just another thing that you have to have. Like it's just such an essential thing of being a musician in the modern times, you know, because people they can't afford studio time or maybe they just don't want to, or there's timing things. And it's like uh, more and more, I just send, they send me tracks. I send out bass tracks, you know, yep. or vocals yep. or whatever. And uh, absolutely. I mean, it's sort of, you know, and, and, and I think, I mean, it seems like you are, and I, I'm really into it and I love, love doing it. I love producing and, you know, mixing and all that stuff. But uh, it, it's it, at the very least, I think you hit it. You have to be able to at least get a tone at home. Like, you know, you don't have to have all the most fancy gear in the world, but you know, right. This is bass player, be able to good, get a good DI signal and probably amp your cabinet too, and do a mix, the kind of classic thing, mix the two things and be yeah. able to come up with that and put it, even if it's simple, right into your, your laptop with an interface, you know, and, and if you don't have a treated room with that's acoustically treated, you, you know, you don't even necessarily need all those things, but just the ability to capture a good signal or whatever of your voice or your instrument. Yeah. I, I would say that's pretty essential for the, for the modern musician. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of got drug into it. I like, I enjoy it now, but I basically self-taught after years of just pulling my hair out, you know, and yeah. recently I've taken some online courses and, you know, just oh, cool. get really deep into a little deeper into like mixing and stuff, because now I'm also looking for different skills and different things I can do to make money because I can't play, you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but I think it's only in the last couple of years where it's like all this gear has become part of the instrument, you know, and part of the flow of, of stuff, you know, but that, that's, it's taken a long time to, at first I was like, you know, I was making these demos for songwriters and, and people I was collaborating, collaborating with. And I was like, I don't really want to be a producer. It's not really my thing. But then it just dawned on me that like, well, look, man, like it or not, you're being a producer. Like I'm making yes. these demos and I'm the one that has the gear. So I just, I better get better at it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's kind of not something I always wanted to do, but it was like, well, you're doing it and and we're giving demos to share, you know, like, yep. and, and nowadays demos don't, they're not like you trashing on your drums in your garage. Like the demos just sound like finished products. You know, this stuff has to be killing. So, it, you know, I sort of, Really? Yeah, you don't have to be. To yeah, you don't have to be the best mix engineer in the world, but you should be able to get a good balanced thing that we hand out. Um, what well, depends on obviously for film the stuff that I've done for TV. Yeah, there's no. I mean, I'm mixing and mastering it all, right? You know, exactly. so it's like it's just. Right. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's it's yeah. a it's a brave new world, you know. But I mean, I I, I kind of on one hand it's sad. I I think it's 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 dichotomy i mean i think it's apparent you know it's it's both things it's sort of sad that these people that spent decades becoming great mix engineers or like great mastering engineers are sort of like, like well the yeah. phone's not ringing as much right. because budgets and people are you know doing and, and you know and, and 
and consequently, there's a lot of subpar stuff that's that's you know be, uh, out there that's you know passing as right. It's just sort yeah. of like like anything. There's degrees of excellence, right? I mean, you can kind of get like okay. There's a lot of people that are like they're okay. I can get an okay mix. They're pretty good, you know, right? Yeah. You want to at least be in that point, like like you said, though. If you're if you're got a number one, right? Get a get a great bass sound. Yeah, right? for I mean, sure. A, you're a bass player, <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, it's sorry. Like, yeah. yeah, I feel like it, the the bare minimum for yeah. me as a keyboard player, I play guitar too. But for, you know, as a, if somebody hires me to do keyboard, my keyboard tracks better sound fantastic. Right. Yeah. Better be giving them yeah. the best sounds, whether they're plugins or whether it's an, um, I'm actually recording a real instrument, it, it, it's got to sound world-class. Just, you just got to do it that way. Yeah. These days. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I was also listening to um, your SoundCloud, Black Beagle Sound. Yeah, that's my studio, Black Beagle Sound. Yeah. Black Beagle Sound, yeah, stuff sounds great. So is that a lot of licensing, licensing stuff? Is that what you're... It's a real mix. I mean, I don't know how far you went down it, but I have so many different kinds of things some of it's like hip-hop productions uh some of them are my original songs that you know some some of which haven't been released yet uh oh, gotcha. singer songwriter things um instrumental jazz it's kind of like me it's all over the place you know yeah but yes but some of the stuff was has been licensed for for tv you know that it's in it's in music libraries some of it is yeah yeah well, it all sounds great. And it's, it's kind of cool because that's like, you. I do a little bit of licensing too. And that's the fun part about it, which is evident in, in the sound class, like whatever idea you have that day, you can make it, you know? And, and like, it's really yeah. eclectic. And it's like, you know, I feel like making a Yacht Rock song today. So totally, I'm, I'm going to go down that path and, and, you know, probably somebody will like it somewhere, you know, we'll figure out where to put it afterwards, but it just allows you to be pretty creative and eclectic with your creativity you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that probably a marketing strategist or strategist or a digital strategist would say, well, we need to focus your sound, your your SoundCloud page a little more and make it a little more identifiable. Because <laughs> if you go down, if you actually go down, like, yeah, there's straight ahead jazz stuff. There's yeah. stuff that's like more old school hip hop. There's, you know, but there's kind of like down tempo, chill kind of music, like sort of in the vibe of the Painted Black single that that just got released. Uh, yeah. yeah so it's, it's kind of all over but that's me i just yeah. love a lot of different styles and i love a lot of different vibes so i just i don't fight it I just you know yeah. it all comes out and i just put it up you know but i think about after all this bitter talk that that's the positive of, of what's happening now yes there is yes. a lot of places to put your music no matter what kind of music you make and or, or if you make a lot of different music you know if you're if you're kind of diligent about it and, and uh, meet the right people and, and, you know, licensing is still a pretty big way to, to make some money. Yeah, no, there's definitely, I've got a lot of stuff. I, a lot is relative. I mean, as we know with the streaming um, royalty rates for cable, <laughs> the, right. the way they are for like, <laughs> you know, I have stuff floating around and in, you know, Netflix shows, Amazon Prime, yeah, that show Marvelous Miss Maisel. I had, I did a whole queue, a whole album of straight ahead jazz tracks. Oh, and one cool. of them got a, like a whole minute and a half in the scene in the Marvelous Miss Maisel, which is so cool. You know, you just oh, play it, they're cool. sitting down at the bar and it's, I don't know if you're familiar with that show. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great so, show. I love that yeah, show. Yeah, it's like, like kind of early 60s Manhattan and she's mm -hmm. a comedian. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, they're sitting in a bar and there's this jazz kind of up-tempo sort of bebop jazz thing playing that I did. And it's pretty cool to watch that. And they're talking and it's playing behind them for, you know, a good minute, uh, 20 seconds or so. Yeah. Back to what I was saying, I lost the train of thought there. But yeah, to make a living doing that stuff, you better have thousands, tens of thousands of them yeah. spinning in rotation all the time. You know, you got to have the major network stuff, which of course pays a better rate, royalty rate, prime time. You know, then you got to, you'll have the cables, you know, have Netflix, Hulu shows, which pays a substantially lower rate. Right. So, you know, you it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's really about having a lot of them. I, I feel like I got into that game a little later. I know guys that have been doing that stuff for so long that they've accrued so much of it that they actually yeah. are, their, their royalty checks are pretty nice because they got in earlier, you know, um, yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to be in the game anyway to have some stuff out there. Yeah. Know? And I think that's like what it is to be a musician too. It's just about all these income streams. You know, you just, 
do it all and and somehow the rent gets paid you know it's exciting though and again going back to going back to the positive i mean how cool is it that like guys like us that weren't like engineers or like producers whatever now we have the tools at our disposal to to make our stuff sound good you know yeah. i mean and it's sort of like it's a double-edged sword you know sure um it's it, it, the downside is that the people that were masters at that and that are masters at that that have been mixing and, and producing as long as we've been playing our instruments right right they're they're seeing less work but then mm -hmm. but that it's it's empowering for us because we've got all these great tools you know right right yeah. well this has been awesome man a lot of great stuff yeah. I really yeah, appreciate you doing the show. My pleasure. No, this is great. Great questions. Great questions. Good, uh, good stuff. It's all, you know, it, it's good to remember we're all kind of all on this together now in this new, you know, the COVID world and making sense of it all and making the, the modern musician career, you know, just, just talking about that and comparing notes is always fun. Can I just, I, I just want to put one last little plug that one song we didn't talk about. I, I did a Corona song. Uh, I don't oh, know if you ever got right. to. I heard, you ever got to. I heard. Yeah, yeah, that, and it actually got some love on YouTube, and that's it's called Why Corona, and uh, it's an original song, and that came out back in April. So yeah, if you want to, throw yes. that, in. that that's also on all the platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, and everything too. And there's a video, official video for it. So anyway, yeah, it's ex it's excellent. I, I uh, that's the first one I listen to because it's the first one that comes up on your if you just you know search you on Spotify. Yeah, it's got it's gotten the most. Oh, oh, right, yeah. It's gotten the most hits because you kind of went through some of the foreigner channels, which <laughs> as we know, you leverage the power of right, yeah. the bigger, bigger beast. You can, you can get, get some more eyeballs on it, but uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I yeah. appreciate it. Uh, you're an awesome player. You've had an awesome career and um, thank you, man. Back at you. Hopefully we'll, we'll you. play another horrible jazz gig sometime. No, no, no. Let's, <laughs> hopefully we'll play another gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a a know, good yeah. gig. I'm a I always think of the keyboard players as like the mad scientists of the band. And when he was talking about the keyboard rig for Foreigner, it really reminded me of how complicated that job can be. Because not only do you have to be able to play, but you also have to have a deep understanding and knowledge of gear and, and sounds and how to program and how to get those sounds. And, uh, you know, he's a, a great example of that. And he's singing as well. So... Um, I just have a bass and a cable and an amp most of the time. We also were joking about the steakhouse gig that we did. and but, but I think it's a really good example of why, if you're living in a major city like L.A. or New York or Nashville, wherever, um, you really have to take every gig seriously. Because I did a handful of those gigs, and I never knew who was going to be on it. And, you know, sometimes it was good. Sometimes it wasn't what it wasn't. But I, every time I showed up, I had to be prepared and I had to be ready to play because you never know who's going to be there and, and playing and you never know who's going to be in the crowd, you know, just having a drink because it is Los Angeles. So um, I think it's a good thing to think about and, uh, to, and to remember. And that night I met an awesome player. I am behind on the cost of releasing a single, apparently. Um, Song Trader is $5 a month or $49 a year, unlimited releases. And DistroKid, like um, Michael brought up, is $19.99 a year for unlimited releases. So that's an amazing deal. Um, I've done a couple records through CD Baby, and that's still $29 per album and $9.99 per single and as and the same goes for TuneCore, so that's a little less economical. But um, I don't know. Now that I know about those other deals, you might be hearing some more music from me. And the guys we mentioned from Berkeley that had musical families, uh, one was Matthew Garrison, and he's the son of Jimmy Garrison, who's a legendary bass player for John Coltrane and Ornette Coleman. And also Abraham Laboriel Jr. is the son of Abraham Laboriel, whose list of credits is way too long to, to mention. He's another legendary bass player. You should definitely know him. Uh, and Abraham Laboriel Jr. actually plays drums with Paul McCartney, so he did quite well after Berkeley. 
Um, the NAM show uh, we mentioned, uh, NAM, N A M M, stands for North American Music Merchants. And it's basically a big convention that happens j- in January in Anaheim. And musicians show up in droves to either sort of shake hands with their the companies that they endorse or play for the companies and or sometimes shop for new endorsements. But also it's just a really big hang. It's sort of the once a year that everyone shows up and, and, uh, and sees each other. And most people go and, and everyone complains about it every year. It's kind of a tradition. And the book Steal Like an Artist is by Austin Cleon. And there's actually a summary on it on audible.com if you like audiobooks. So if you do, go to audiotrial.com slash rockstar and um, you could sign up for a free trial and listen to that book. And you'd really be helping out the podcast here. Well, I really hope you had a great time. I'm a dive rock star. Wow, you've made it to the end. I'm hoping it's because you completely enjoyed yourself and are now filled with knowledge and inspiration to move forward with your dreams. If that is the case and you would like to stay informed of new episodes, live events, and general news, please go to divebarrockstar.com and sign up for the mailing list. If you have any questions, comments, corrections, or complaints about anything you hear on the show, please email me at fanmail at divebarrockstar.com, and you may even end up on the show. We at the Dive Bar Rockstar Podcast, with all of our hearts, thank you for listening, and remember, it's all about dreams. <laughs>